Well, we're going to continue our series on the good steward. And I'm, I mean, I'm just, this is the third week on stewardship and you guys keep coming back. Like I'm tickled. I, I, didn't, I thought by the third week I'd already ran everybody off, but it just goes to show how much you love Jesus and uh, how serious you are about God. So we've been in this series called The Good Steward. If you're visiting with us today, we usually take four weeks, as, as many as 12 weeks, to do a series to kind of build on what we've been preaching on. So it can stand alone, but it also builds on the last two weeks. And if you are new today, we have Connect right after this service. We would love to host you. It's your next step. If you're trying to figure out if this is your church, if I'm your pastor, how you can plug in, you want to know a little bit more about it, we have lunch provided, child care provided, 1230 in the kids auditorium, which is right down that hallway, we would love to to have you. But here's our key verse. Moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are supposed to be a steward. It's one who manages another's property, resources, our affairs. And we've been learning that to be a good steward, you've got to have some foundational principles in your life. And one of them is that God's the owner and we're the manager. God owns it all. Everything you have is because of God. He blesses you. He, he provides for you. And he's the owner. And, and we're just the managers. It's like Joseph. Joseph is in the Old Testament character. Miraculously, he went from favored son to sold into slavery to prison. And then he gets to the second in charge of Egypt. And the Pharaoh says, hey, Joseph, this is mine, but I want you to manage it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to micromanage you. I'm not going to tell you, look, I just want you to oversee it. I want you to do it with integrity. I want you to do it with skill. I'm the owner, but Joseph, you're the manager. Adam and Eve in the garden, they got everything provided by them, by God. And God said, hey, it's mine. I created it, but you're going to manage it. And when you're a follower of Jesus, he's the owner and we're the managers. Here's the second thing. If he's the owner, his word is authoritative. So if he owns it all, then I got to figure out how he wants me to manage it. If he's the owner, I can't do it as I like necessarily. I've got to come under the authority of the owner, find out how he wants me to manage his resources and do it accordingly. So not only does God own it all, he's the owner and I'm the manager. Because he's the owner, his word is authoritative. And then the third point is your heart and your treasure are connected. God doesn't necessarily want your treasure, he wants your heart, but your heart always follows your treasure. So those are the three foundational principles and today I wanna to talk to you, conclude this series on do rich right. I want us to pray. Father, we thank you for your word today and I pray in Jesus' name that you'd help me to communicate it properly. Lord, that I would, I would share your word with authority, that I would share your word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and hearts would receive it today. And, and today we would make a decision right now, not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to get you to Luke chapter 12, and I want to set the stage. Jesus, at the beginning of the chapter, is teaching. and he, Well, first he rebukes the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. And he really goes at him, and he's the hardest on Pharisees than, 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 than any other group. And then he points his attention to some of those in the crowd, and he says, hey, don't fear the people that can kill your body. There was a lot of persecution. Don't fear them. Feel, fear the one that's able to condemn you to hell. What, what Jesus was saying is, don't fear man, fear God. And then he told his disciples, hey, be courageous for me. Be vocal in your testimony of me. I, I don't want you to, to be silent saints. I, I want you to have a strong testimony and a bold witness. And in the middle of his teaching, I mean, I, I want you to put yourself there. He's going at it. He's giving them all he's got. In the middle of his teaching, someone in the crowd said to him, some knucklehead raised his hand and said, Jesus, I got a question. I got a problem I need you to answer. T teacher, tell my brother to, invite, to divide the inheritance with me. My mom and dad just died, and, and my brother's stingy, and he won't give me what's rightfully mine. Would you talk to him and make sure he gives me the fair share? I, I mean, you think about it. It's, it's funny. You're not laughing, but it's kind of funny. 
And, and it's kind of an awkward moment and situation. And, and Jesus responds to him, man who appointed me judge and arbitrator between you. I know you call me rabbi and rabbis back in that day would be arbitrators, but I'm not a normal arbitrator. I'm, I'm, that's not, I'm not here to talk about that. But since you brought it up, let's talk about money. You know, Jesus talked more about money than any prayer and faith combined. 16 of his 38 parables were about stewardship and managing your resources so that you could be a good and faithful servant. And so he says, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. And so he said to them, and again, I, I don't want to be monotonous, but I want you to put yourself in the crowd. He was teaching, he was sharing, he was challenging. Some knothead raises his hand, and Jesus just takes a left turn and goes down that path. And he says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For a man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Let me define greed for you. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. The assumption, if you can't remember it, I can sing it to you. Remember, conjunction, junction, that's my function. Y'all old people remember that? Even some of you young people remember that. But, but maybe put it to a tune. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. Maybe, maybe this will help better. Anything that comes to me is for me. You might believe the Bible and call yourself a follower of Jesus, but when it comes down to big decisions like what job are you gonna work at and where are you gonna choose to live and who are you gonna vote for, if it comes down to how this is gonna leave me financially, or am I gonna have enough? Or am I gonna be able to get what I want? Or am I going to be, be able to leverage for more? Or how does this affect me financially? If either consciously or subconsciously, your chief concern, your ultimate dependence relies on your income, your finances, you're probably fueled by greed. You have an assumption that it's all for your consumption. You, you, have, you have a belief that anything comes to me is to be used for me. Here's what the Bible, again, talks about greed. Paul told the church at Ephesus, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. We, we, we've, we understand, or at least we've seen, the sin of sexuality, how it divides families and rips apart homes and destroys men's and ruin, men and, and ruins destinies and potential. Sexual immorality destroys, and so Paul says, hey man, I don't even want you to have a hint of it or any kind of impurity or of greed. I don't want you to have this thinking that, that the assumption that everything that I get is for me. I don't want you to have that attitude because these things, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed are improper for God's holy people. It's not how you're supposed to live. It's not how you're supposed to think. You're different from the world. You think differently, you act differently, you talk differently, you believe differently, and greed should not be a part of who you are. Here's another verse for, for this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. A greedy person is an idolater. An idolater is one who puts anything in the rightful position or priority that Jesus should hold. So something else is more important. Something else is, is to be honored or revered or respected, to be pursued more than Jesus. And idolater is not someone who sets up, it could be, sets up some figurine and bows down to it. A, an idolater is somebody who has removed Jesus from the throne of their heart and replaced it with somebody else. And in this case, it's money. If you're a greedy person, you're an idolater, and you have no inheritance in the kingdom of the kingdom of Christ and of God. So Jesus said to this guy, knucklehead raised his hand, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possession. And to reinforce, he doesn't stop there, he doesn't go back to teaching. Well, he does go back to teaching, but he stays on this topic. And to reinforce it, he tells a story you, you're the one that brought up money. You're the one that brought up inheritance. Okay, let me teach you on this. 
He told him this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Anybody ever dream about being rich? You bunch of liars. You, th you, you think you're in church, you gotta act all spiritual and holy. I know you drive by all that big lotto sign and see $850 million and you think, boy, if I won that, would my world change? What I could do, what I could have, what I could save, maybe even who I could help. That we, we, we drink. I used to watch the Jeffersons. Remember the Jeffersons? Poor fellow that moving on up to the east side or west side or wherever it was to a deluxe apartment in the sky. I mean, I thought I got a George Jefferson and Wheezy made it. They, they made it. Here's the good news. You're rich. I'm rich. You know how I know we're rich? Because we have rich opportunities. We have school and sports and music lessons and dentists and doctors and babysitters and weight loss programs and pool memberships and vacations and Christmas and birthday parties and massage therapists. We have DoorDash. <laughs> we're rich. We have rich stuff, and I realize there today that some people are struggling. Maybe you're here today and you've just went through a nasty divorce, and not just your heart was trampled on, but you've been left in a financial mess. Maybe you fought a, a major illness, or maybe you're fighting it now, and, and insult to injury, the bills are starting to mount up, but you're not sure what you're going to do. Or maybe you're a single parent with a low-paying job and a deadbeat ex, and you revived your car from the dead six times, and, and you just, you're, and my heart breaks for you, and we wanna help you as a church if we can. But the most of us in this room, we're doing pretty good. And you say, well, not me. As you watch cable on your smart TV, eating a hot pizza delivered to your door, ordered by, ordered from your iPhone with unlimited text and a data plan, we're doing okay. The vast majority of the world describes the West, and they say there are people so rich that they own their own car. Do you, only, do you know only 5% of the world owns their own car? Some of them are so rich they have two cars, and they have a house for their car called a garage that so keeps it out of the elements and it keeps it protected. And they're so rich they drive by multiple restaurants and they can stop at these restaurants and they can pay for somebody to fix their meals and serve it to them. And some of them eat out way too much and they get a little big and so they go to a place called a gym and they pay a health coach to help them get back in shape. And they're so rich they have a throne in their house. We call it a toilet, they call it a throne. And all they do is press a little magic lever and all the bad stuff goes right out of the house. They have rooms for their clothes. Nobody sleeps in them, it's just for their clothes. And some people are so rich they have his and her rooms for clothes. And in those closets, there's summer clothes and winter clothes and work clothes and church clothes and play clothes. I, I hope you're getting the point. 50% of the world lives on less than $2 a day and we complain we don't have enough. If the world, someone said if the world could be broken down into 100 people living in one village, 70 would be unable to read. Only one of the 100 would have a college education. 50 would be suffering from malnutrition. 80 would live in homes uh, unfit for human habitation. Six of the villagers would control all the money. We are the six. The good news is we're rich. The bad news is we're rich. Being rich is the greatest challenge to overcome to being a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 10, we're seeing a picture of the rich young ruler who had gone to church and, and memorized some scripture and, and was a good dude, but Jesus identified the sin of greed in his life and he was bound by materialism and Jesus spoke to it and he said, only time in scripture he said, hey, go and sell everything that you have. You want to follow me and then come follow me. And the guy, because he was bound in greed and he thought everything, his assumption was everything for his, for his consumption, he, he turned his back on God, he went away sad, and Jesus said, do you know how hard it is for rich people to get to heaven? 
It, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of, the, eye of a needle than for a rich person to have a relationship with me that is totally based on faith and trust and dependence. The good news is we're rich. The bad news is we're rich. When you're rich, it's harder to, de to depend on God. When you don't have anything, you gotta have God. Amen. When you don't know your, where your next meal is coming from, you're dependent on God. When you don't have any doctors or medicines to heal your disease, you're dependent on God. You gotta trust God. We, we got it. It's at our fingertips. Most of us can get to it. And so our security becomes more about what we make than, than who we serve. It becomes more about the doctor that we go to than the great physician that can heal us. It's harder to depend on God. When you're rich, it distracts us from, from true priorities that followers ought to be. Like we know church is important. You gotta know that. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. Uh, gathering as the body of Christ for believers is really not an option. Like you know, if you've, if you've distanced yourself from the church, you can usually see your relationship with Christ distancing. There's something about being connected to God and being connected to a local church. But when we're rich, it's not as important maybe as it should be. Why? Because we have lake houses and season tickets and golf memberships and travel sports and hobbies and things that get in the way. It's just harder. When you're rich, you have a greater responsibility to much is given, much is required. You know, because you're rich, because I'm rich, we're held more accountable. We're judged more closely. Expectations are higher. Responsibilities are greater. Here, here's what Jesus responded to that, that knucklehead that raised his hand. Hey, let me talk to you about your greed, the assumption that it's all for your consumption. It's a sin that I hate because it competes with me for your allegiance. See, see we're, we're rich. God has blessed us. And I, so I think the question is, what do we do with our riches? How do we do rich right? And so we study this man, this man in the story, and he says the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Can I just pause there? And can I, I just remind you that the rich man did work hard, and he prepared, and he sacrificed, and he sweat, but it was the ground of the rich man that produced the good crop. It was the ground that yielded the bumper crop. The ground produced the product that he could sell and trade and consume. As much credit as he wanted to take for his income, the reality is that God caused the field to produce a good crop. He let the sun go in the sky. He brought the rain to, to help it. We're rich because of God. He's the source. He's the supplier. He's the provider. I'm glad you work hard. That's a great, that, that's a great quality. I'm glad you sacrifice because without sacrifice, most of us don't get anywhere. I'm glad you put in the time and the sweat. It's an admirable trait. But you're not rich just because of your creativity or your work ethic or your gifting or your ability. You're rich because God has called what you're doing to produce a good crop. Here's what Ecclesiastes says. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions, and I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. I'm not trying to condemn us. God has made us wealthy. We don't, we don't have to get all guilt and we don't have to get shameful about it. And he's given us the ability to enjoy them. We can enjoy what God has given us because they're a gift from God. So this is not about, one time God says, go and sell all you have and give to the poor. That's not the message. That's not the, the God's just trying to teach us how to do rich, right? Enjoy it. Thank God for it. But here's how this guy does it. He thought to himself, what am I going to do? I have all this excess. I have all this stuff. I have no place to even store it. Do you know there are five times as many storage unit places? I mean, I don't mean units. I mean storage 
like that have all the units. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to, facilities, storage facilities, five times more storage facilities than there are Starbucks in America. You driven down Hull Street? There's a Starbucks. Uh, you think about it, every time you see a Starbucks, there's five times more storage facilities because we don't have enough room in our homes to store our stuff. Again, I'm not, it's not guilting you. I'm, it's just the reality. And this is what we do. And this is what this dude did. And he said, then this is what I'll do. I'll tear down, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. That's the answer. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have so much goods laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. It's greed. The assumption that it's all for my consumption. That anything that comes to me is to be used for me. And here's how the owner, God, replied. You fool. You know how I looked up full and here's what, one who acts contrary to sound wisdom in the way he behaves, one who follows his own inclinations, who prefers trifling and temporary pleasure to the service of God and eternal happiness. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? But it didn't end there because he wasn't just talking about an Old Testament man, he was trying to relate it to us, and so he brings it personally. He says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself. But, again, th there, there's a but. It, it, you can do both. You can be rich. You can be blessed. You can enjoy your blessing. But if, it, but if you're not rich towards God then you're not doing rich right. So what's the antidote for greed? What's the antithesis? Okay, I don't wanna be greedy. I don't wanna be materialistic. I don't wanna be called a fool. I want to be a good steward. Pastor, what do I do? And I don't wanna sound monot uh, what? monotonous. <laughs> I don't even know how I want I don't even know how I want to sound. I can't even say it. <laughs> but here's what you got to do. You got to give. If you're going to do rich right, you have to give. And it starts with your tithe. Remember that's the starting point of good stewardship. Leviticus 27, 30, one more time, a tithe of everything. A tithe by definition means 10%. If you're giving 6%, you're giving, but you're not tithing. A tithe is one-tenth, and your tithe is holy to the Lord. It's consecrated. It's set apart. It's taken right off the top. It's given first. It's not yours to use. It's his to return. As a good steward, at realizing God's the owner and I'm the manager, my first step is to give my tithe. New Testament, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. It's not equal giving, it's proportionate giving. Well, what's the proportion? 10%. Saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Hearing that, some of you Break out in involuntary seizures. I gotta give the Lord 10% of my money? Are you crazy? Next week, you're gonna ask me to drink the Kool-Aid. You're gonna get me in a plane and take me to a remote island. To give 10%, I would have to totally rearrange my life. Exactly. 
You have to rearrange your life around God. Every time we return our tithes, it reminds us we're putting God first. You know why followers of God tithe? Because they love him. And out of obedience, they choose to honor him. It reminds them of their source. Paul said, what do we even have that we did not receive from God? Because what he's done for me, freely I have received, freely I will give. Because it's his plan to finance the kingdom, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Because I don't want to be a thief. You ask, how do I rob God? When you don't give your tithes and offerings. Because I want God's blessing. Give and it will be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Because it pleases God. God loves a cheerful giver. Tithing is not for God, it's for us. God doesn't need your money. He wants what it represents. It's an, it's an expression of gratitude. Thank you, God, for your generosity towards me. It's an act of priority. The purpose of tithing is to ensure that you keep God first. It's an act of faith. God, I believe I can trust you on the 90% that's blessed than the 100% that's not. And you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know what breaks the power of greed? You know what overcomes the lure, lure of materialism? Giving. And it begins with your tithe. And then after you tithe, you give as the Holy Spirit leads. And this is important. Here's what the Bible says. But just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. And, and, and here, let me share this first. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Let me tell you how this works. Angie and I, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want to come across in any way braggadocious or anything. I am telling you, I get a lot wrong. By the grace of God, Angie and I have got this part of our lives right. We, we've always, we have given 10% forever. I told you before I grew up in the church, so it wasn't hard for me. If I made a dollar, I gave 10 cents. If I made $10, so then when I started making more money, it was just part of the, so I get it for you that have never done it. It's like, wow, what, what in the world's going on? And, and God will help you, but, but we've got that part. We, we've done it. And I, I, I tied to Clover Hill. Like, I don't tell you to do something I don't do. We give above and beyond our tithe because we believe in the ministry. We believe in the people we're affecting and the lives we're reaching and the marriages we're helping and the difference we're making in the community. And so we cheerfully return our tithe to the place we call our church. But then there's times where the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. And, and when you're a child of God, that's how he operates. Again, it's not out of law, it's out of relationship. And I don't do it because I have to, I do it because I get to. And I'm in relationship with him. And so he, we, I was having lunch with a, a, a young pastor and he was telling me about his struggles and his challenges and financially he was, he was having a hard time and I could relate to him. I, I know the pain, I know, I've been there. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, give him $500. And so I went home and asked the other Holy Spirit in my life. <laughs> and Angie's much more generous than I am. And she said, whatever's in your heart, do it. This week we found out about a mom, that single mom, that again, a deadbeat ex that won't do what he's supposed to do. And, and she's struggling to make ends meet. And I had a conversation with her and I thought, yeah, well, the church can help you. And as, as soon as I said the church can help you, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you help her. Like, you preach on it. Here's an opportunity to do it. And so I went home, Angie, what do you think? And we prayed about it, and God gave us the same number, and, and we, were able, we were able to bless her. I talked about it last week. The goal, the goal of good stewardship is that you have all you need. And listen, when you're on a budget and when you're living within your means and you're living in the appropriate seasons and you've created margin and you're staying and getting out of consumer debt, then you're, you're being a good steward. You're going to have all you need. And then God's going to bless. And when you have all you need, there's going to be plenty left over to share with others. That's the goal. That's where we want to be. That's, that's the place we want to be at. Listen, I want to do rich right. 
I, I don't want to get bound up in greed. I don't want to be sucked in by materialism. I don't want to have an idol. I don't want to be an idolater. I don't want to have the assumption that it's all for my consumption. I want to honor the Lord by returning the first 10%. Right. And I want to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit when he directs me to do otherwise. Can I give you one more scripture and then I'm going to close and we're going to baptize some kids. Here's what Paul told Timothy. Paul is a pastor. He's really an apostle. Timothy's a pastor. Hey, hey, Timothy, I want you to do something for me. Command, command. Like it's not an option. I'm not giving them, I, I want you to, you know what a command is? It's for your good, for others' benefit, or for the good of the kingdom. God's not trying to strap them. He's trying to help them. He's not trying to box them in. He's trying to free them up. Command those who are rich in this present world. That's us again. You might not think you're rich, but compared to the world, we're swimming in wealth. Don't be arrogant to put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. For who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to be rich. It means exuberant, over and above, beyond in good deeds. And be generous and willing to share. Don't, don't only think about yourself. You got all that you need plenty of leftover now share it with others and in this way when you're generous two things happen in this way you'll lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age when you're generous blesses you when you get to heaven that's why Jesus said don't store up treasures on earth where rust decay it and destroy it and moss eat it kill it store up treasures in heaven where that stuff can't get to it it, it does something you when you're generous, it, it compounds for eternity. But then he says, second thing, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. So it's not only an eternal blessing, but it's a blessing right now. Life right there is Zoe life. It's abundant overcoming life. It's the life that Jesus died for. There is something about being generous and living an overcoming abundant life. They're tied together. So here's my, here's my challenge. Here's the word of the Lord this morning. Do rich right. Amen, everybody. Stand with me, will you? And I want you to ask yourself this question. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me?